Thank you very much for dragging yourself away from your study or, or workplaces on a perfect Melbourne evening. We seem to be having a few of those lately. Uh, it's certainly been a big few months at Toll. Uh, Ziga mentioned the takeover of Japan Post, so we've had a very interesting few months. I'll talk to you a little bit about that later on because there seems to be a fair bit of interest in the transaction uh, from all sorts of different people. But it's actually a great pleasure to get away from that for, for a while tonight and, uh, and come and speak to all of you. So I'm really looking forward to tonight. I'll keep my presentation fairly brief because I'm actually more interested in responding to your questions and talking about the things that you want to hear about. But I will talk a little bit about Toll, I'll talk a little bit about the Japan Post takeover. And then, then as the title of the, uh, the, the talk would suggest, I'll talk a little bit about what we've done at Toll around building our culture and how we use values and beliefs to help us with our decision making. So that's the plan. I always feel old when people, I'm starting to feel old when people like Ziga talk about what I've, uh, what I've done in my career when you say I was in resources for 25 years before I joined Toll. So, uh, but look, I've, I've been really fortunate with my career, uh, both really at, at BHP and then subsequently at Blue Scope and then now at Toll, to have had some fantastic experiences. Uh, even at BHP while I was there for a lot of years, I did all sorts of different jobs, everything from corporate accounting roles uh, to treasury type roles. I worked in North America for four years building a steel plant, um, came back and worked in M&A uh, when Paul Anderson was sort of fixing the company back in the, in the late 90s and that was a fantastic experience. Left and joined Blue Scope Steel when it was spun out from, from BHP and I've got a few colleagues around, ex-colleagues around the room tonight. Uh, and then joined, uh, joined Toll as Zika said about six years ago in, in total and took over as CEO about three years ago. And I think um, uh, I've seen lots of good examples of culture working well. I've seen some examples where it hasn't worked so well as well. So I'll try and share some of those uh, experiences with you tonight. Uh, I, I used to always assume that everybody knows who Toll is and what we do. Um, I've learnt a couple of times though now that that's not always the case and I'll just recount a quick story for you where uh, I was visiting a fund manager in the US um, as we do when we're a public company, go and speak to people trying to encourage them to invest in our businesses and I walked in and sat down and the first thing he said to me, so toll, you guys would do toll roads right? <laughs> and so I've learnt not to assume that everybody knows what we do. So I thought I'd take advantage of tonight just to explain a little bit about, uh, about what we do. Um, we've actually been around for a lot of years, in fact over 120 years as a company. Um, the name Toll comes from our founder, his name's Albert Toll. Uh, Albert Toll started the business of moving coal in Newcastle using a, a horse and cart. So we've come a long way since then. Um, today we have about 40,000 people in our organisation, um, a bit over half of those in Australia and what surprises a lot of people is that nearly half of our employees are actually outside Australia. So we're a very, very international organisation. Uh, we operate in about 1,200 locations in 50 different countries. That's a little bit flattering, some of those are quite small. We've probably got serious operations in about a dozen countries. Um, clearly Australia and New Zealand, but we've also got very big operations now in Singapore, um, in China, in India, uh, in the US, in the UK, and obviously in Japan, even before the takeover. Um, we actually have about 4,000 employees now existing business in Japan. We do service a very broad range of markets, uh, both in Australia and abroad. So everything from the resources sector, bulk mining, uh, energy, through to fast moving consumer goods, uh, the industrial sector, we do a lot of government and defence work. So we sort of have to be a bit of an expert on all of those markets. Um, to give you a few numbers, we've got about 3,000 heavy vehicles in Australia. Um, I've had people tell me it looks like more than that since we've all had consistent logos. Um, people travelling up and down the freeways now always observe that they, they think they see more toll, toll trucks than they used to. It's actually just that you can now tell they're all toll. Um, we, uh, those 3,000 heavy vehicles so, sorry, travel about 300 million kilometres every year. We deliver something like 54 million consignments every year and 
more recently, nearly two million of those have actually been online retail deliveries. And that part of our business is obviously the fastest growing market that we operate in. Interestingly, not a lot of people know we have uh, 48 aircraft in our fleet and we fly around 200 flights a day to about 130 different airports across Australia. So there's some quite unique challenges that come with operating that sort, the sort of business that we do, that breadth of operations, the breadth of markets that we serve and the breadth of geographies that we serve. But it also is uh, quite an exciting place to work. And of course, as we've mentioned uh, last Thursday, um, the most exciting recent thing to happen to us, we now have a new owner, uh, which is Japan Post. And as I observed to somebody earlier, if you had have asked me at this stage of the career, of my career, whether I thought I'd be working for the Japanese government, um, you would have got a resounding no not that, not that long ago. But look, I'll just talk for a few seconds about the actual um, transaction because it's been, um, it's been quick. Uh, it's obviously a very big transaction, as Ziga mentioned. Um, and I'm actually quite proud of the way that our team and Japan Post and the various advisors that we had actually managed the transaction. We've had a lot of feedback from people in investment banking circles and fund management circles about how this transaction appears as though it was managed differently from other public markets transactions that you've seen before. Uh, the initial approach from Japan Post actually happened in the first week of December last year. And I had a phone call from uh, an investment banker that I know um, on, it was actually the 4th of December. And I was on the phone, so my assistant answered the phone and she came in to me and said, David wants to bring in some people from Japan Post to see you tomorrow afternoon, is that okay? And I looked at my diary and I said, look, I'm really busy, I'm not sure I've got time. Um, get him to meet Avi, who's our head of strategy and mergers and acquisitions. So anyhow, they set the meeting up for 4.30 the next day and about 4.32, Avi knocks on my door and says, actually, you better come and see these guys. Um, so uh, I wandered up to our boardroom and uh, a gentleman from Japan Post uh, told me that they intended on making a bid for toll. And so he explained a bit about that and then he said, so when are you guys taking holidays? So why do you want to know when I'm taking holidays for? And he said, because we don't want our bid to interrupt your holidays. <laughs> so I thought it was quite, it was quite instructive and um, interesting just to understand how much respect that they have and the, and the way that they operate, that they'd even think about something like that. Um, anyway, we went from there and uh, we, we've had a few visits to Japan. Uh, we did a lot of negotiation through the month of January and February. It was interesting having to keep the deal as confidential as we, we had. Um, I had some unusual experiences, at least recently for me, and that I was spending weekends actually writing presentations myself. I haven't had to do that for a while, so, so that was kind of different. Uh, but uh, we got to the point on the 18th of February where we announced uh, the transaction. And I think, as I said, we surprised a lot of people, not just with you know, the offer and the way the offer was structured, uh, but also the fact that we'd been able to keep the transaction confidential up until that point. And uh, I won't talk through all of the way that we managed to do that, but as I said, it's very unusual and I think uh, really quite reflective of the way that we try to manage ourselves at Toll and certainly the way that Japan Post managed themselves, that we were able to, to do the transaction the way we did. Uh, it's actually, for all of us at Toll, I think a great opportunity with, with Japan Post. Uh, they are an enormously big organisation. I think we've probably got some stats up on the, the screen. Some of those numbers are pretty mind-blowing. So we're, being, we're becoming part of an extremely strong business. You probably don't know, but Japan Post is being spun out from the Japanese government later this year. So Japan Post will become a publicly owned company later this calendar year. Uh, but will be spun off in a way that leaves them with an exceptionally strong balance sheet. And that will create some opportunities for us to help them meet their growth ambitions, which are very, very significant. The two companies joining together today creates the fifth largest logistics organisation in the world with revenues of about 33 billion US dollars. And they've got aspirations to get materially bigger than that in a fairly quick period of time. So I think it's exciting from that point of view. Uh, you know, there's no real crossover of our businesses today. So that's great news for our employees. We're not going to be banging a whole lot of parts of our businesses together and, and you know, creating synergies through people losing their jobs. So that's fantastic news. It's obviously been a great deal for our shareholders. I think it'll be a great deal for our, our customers as well. 
Uh, so it's one of these nice transactions or unusual transactions where I actually can't think of anybody who's going to be worse off as a result of it. So as I said, very, very exciting future for us. There will be some challenges. Uh, clearly one of those will be the fact that despite the fact we have a Japanese business today, we do recognise that the Japanese culture is very different to the Australian culture. So we're working our way through all of those issues. I think both, both we, because we're an international company and we've had a lot of experiences in international company, are quite used to dealing with different cultures. I think that will help. And Japan posts a very understanding of the fact that the two organisations come from different countries. But one of the things which made me the happiest when we were talking to Japan Post about the opportunities was understanding that our corporate values are actually quite consistent. And I think that will make the integration of the two companies much easier than it otherwise would have been. Uh, from an integrity point of view, they are, they are fantastic. Um, in terms of uh, respect, they are fantastic to work with. Uh, their approach to safety, um, we're learning about that, but I, I'm sure it's very similar to ours. So there's a lot of very um, similar values there that I think will make that, as I said, make that integration much easier than it otherwise would have been. So it's probably a nice lead-in to talk about uh, Toll's values and what we've done to, to, I guess, establish a consistent culture across the group. And it's been a journey we've been on for a while. Uh, some of you will know the history of Toll. Um, I made the observation to somebody earlier today that my, my predecessor, Paul Little, who a lot of you will know, uh, was almost in the, in the, the um, uh, his, his approach was almost buy anything that wasn't bolted down. Uh, so Paul did something like 100 acquisitions over a very short period of time. And when I joined and Paul, Paul helped start this process, we recognised that it was probably time to slow down on the acquisition front and actually start to try to um, integrate our existing businesses a lot better than what we'd, we'd done previously. And so we developed this program called One Toll. It's not a very inventive name, uh, but I think it says a lot. And that meant all sorts of things. It, but one of the things that it meant was trying to build a consistent culture and a consistent set of values across our group. Because you can imagine when we'd done 100 acquisitions of all sorts of different types of companies from all sorts of different regions, we did have a broad range of culture and values across our group. But we knew that if we were going to be successful in one toll and try to help our businesses work better together, that was an area that we needed to do some work on. So in terms of the process, how did we go about doing that? It was kind of, um, um, I can still remember the, the day we had the meeting about it because I sat down with our, our head of HR and we we're talking about the process we need to go through. And I said, well, I know what our culture and our values need to be. I'll just write them down on a piece of paper and we'll send them out to everybody. And she quickly reminded me that wasn't very clever. Um, and uh, so we went through, I think, a fantastic process where we involved a great number of our people from across the group to help us identify what were the good parts of the culture that we had, what were the things that people thought we should leave behind, and what were the things we needed to do better to be successful with the journey we wanted to head on. And uh, we had something like two and a half to 3,000 people involved uh, very closely in that process. A great cross-section of people from different levels of the organisation and from different geographies and different business units. And what we've ended up with um, is what we've called the Toll Way. And the Toll Way has got a few elements to it. It talks about our vision and our mission, but it also um, espouses our values and importantly talks about our core beliefs. I won't spend too long on each of these. Um, they do mean a lot to us at Toll. But when we put these words together, I would hazard a guess to say that most other top companies would have a lot of words that look very similar. Okay, there's not too many of those people go, well, integrity and trust is a bad idea or safety is a bad idea or innovation is a bad idea. So during the process, we felt we've actually got to bring these values to life. And we've got to talk about them in a way that people can understand um, and understand how we want them to influence the decisions that they make. And so what we did was set about developing um, a fairly succinct set of beliefs. And to me, these words actually mean a lot more and give people a lot more guidance than just those sort of single words on a page. So these are the beliefs 
that we came up with and I'll just spend a couple of minutes talking about them. So the first one is a really interesting one when you work in our industry. Okay, all injuries are preventable and everyone's got the right to go home safely. Now we had a lot of debate about whether or not we really, really meant this. You work in our industry, you've got a lot of drivers on the roads. They interact with a lot of other people on the roads. And sometimes, you know, the words was, sometimes accidents happen. Okay, that was the debate we had. And we also had uh, lots of discussions, pardon my French, about the dickhead factor. You know, some people are just going to come in, they just want to do the wrong thing. Okay, so how do we deal with all those things? Well, the mindset's got to be, if you have an accident on the road, even if it was somebody else's fault, had you trained the driver in defensive driving? Did he have the latest technology in his truck? And it's really about what could we have done differently to avoid that injury? And it's just a different mindset for people to have that all injuries are preventable. You've really got to believe that. And I think we're, we're, we're really establishing a different safety culture because of that belief. Um, even with the dickhead factor, sorry about the term, uh, you know, we say, oh, that guy just did the wrong thing. Well, the question's got to be, when did his supervisor last have a discussion with him about safety? Was the culture right for his mates that probably saw him doing the wrong thing to actually say, listen, I don't think that's a safe thing to do, please stop. So there are always ways to deal with these things when you, you've got that belief. The next one, again, we spent a lot of time uh, discussing and it took a while to get this one through the organisation. And I'll just give you a little story about uh, rolling out this belief and what I did personally to sort of try to get things rolling. So in an organisation of our size, we have uh, capital expenditure authority levels. And one of the things that I first did when we talked about, well, if we're serious about this, I actually should be giving my direct reports some more authority in terms of capital spending that they can do without having to come to me. So I did that. It significantly increased their, their level of authority. And about three months later, we had a meeting and I thought, I'll test, I'll test all my direct reports. So guys, how many of you have actually increased the authority levels for your guys? Guess what the answer was? So again, these things take time, but you know, when, if you really believe these, you've actually got to take the actions to support them. So now I'd like to think we're still on a journey, but um, you know, our, our senior people and our managers are actually really living that, that issue. Uh, the next one sounds pretty obvious. Um, sometimes it's difficult, no question. Sometimes it's difficult to show people respect, but we really try, do try to do this with all of our stakeholders. Um, we try to do it with um, all of our employees, obviously. We try to do it with all of our customers. We try to do it with our competitors. Uh, we do it with government. We do it with regulators. Uh, and if I can recount a story about where I'm really thrilled about this one. In just in the last few weeks, we had uh, the uh, road regulator in New South Wales, so Roads and Maritime Services, come and do a blitz at a big site of ours in Sydney to check our vehicles, uh, drug test drivers, do all of those sorts of things. And the feedback that I got from uh, one of the senior compliance officers at RMS, he took the time to ring me and he said, look, we found a couple of issues and we can work through those with you, but I just wanted you to know, this is one of the first times we've undertaken this sort of thing where, where people have actually gone out, the employer or the, the company have actually gone out of their way to help us do our job. So normally we just get the pushback, we don't want to talk to you, we want to avoid everything there is to do with you. Now I think the respect that we showed the RMS guys goes a long way to building the right sort of relationship with them. So I'm thrilled that that message is getting through and, you know, again, we'll have, we'll have issues with it all the time, but the message is we, we think if we treat people with respect, we'll get the same coming back at us. The next one is, uh, is pretty important. This, you would have seen one of the, uh, the core values that we spoke about or that we had on the previous page was around continuous improvement. Now, if you believe that, you've got to have a belief that allows people to make mistakes. Provided they're doing the right thing, they're trying to do the right thing, you've got to be tolerant of people making mistakes if you really want people to innovate. So again, that's a, that's a key one, hope, hopefully driving that, uh, the innovation effort around the group. The next one is really important. Um, I'll talk a little bit about a, a story about a football club that we still sponsor in a few minutes. But I'd have to say, when I saw their slogan that said, whatever it takes, 
that was, that was always going to be a problem. Uh, you have to go about success, achieving your success the right way if you want it to be sustainable. You can take shortcuts. Uh, you will never have sustainable success. And I do think it's a really challenging issue for public companies to do this because we are under extreme pressure to deliver a set of results next time we go out to the market and to hit the analyst expectations. So there's a real temptation to do that, sometimes do it the wrong way. So we are trying to instill this value in our people about making sure that they hit their performance targets the right way, in a sustainable way. The last one, oh sorry, not the last one, the, the, uh, the belief around acting ethically and within the law, again, sounds pretty obvious, but when you work in some of the countries that we operate in, for those of you that have had experience working overseas, you'll know this is challenging. And I had some of our senior people in some of our operations really wanting to challenge this particular belief and were we really going to live it. Because we operate in some markets where unless you're willing to do the wrong thing, you won't have that short-term success. So this is a, another really critical one that helps guide decisions for us. And I'll, talk some, I'll give you some examples about that in a minute. And the last one is a different mindset as well. Often the temptation is to go into discussions with customers and you can be thinking about a win, you're faced with a win-lose situation with the customers. It's really important that our mindset is about helping our customers be successful. So at the end of the day, that will help us. And again, I'll give you some examples about that in a few minutes. First one, I, the first thing before I get into some examples, I just want to drill down on the safety, uh, the safety value for a minute because it is, for me personally, I don't like ranking these. I don't like ranking our values and our beliefs. But if I had to rank one and put it above all others, it's the safety one. And there are really lots of good reasons why it is smart to be good at safety. You know, the first one of those is uh, if you need to be good at safety, you need to have good engagement with your people, you need to have good processes, you need to have good disciplines. And so generally businesses that perform well from a safety perspective perform well from all sorts of other perspectives as well. And I challenge you to find a business that is successful in the long term that is bad at safety. It just, that just doesn't happen. So that correlation, there's a lot of studies out there for the academics in the room that will show you that the companies that perform best from a safety perspective perform best in the long run from all other sorts of metrics as well. As I said, it's, you do need to engage well with your workforce if you want to be good at safety. You need to have conversations about safety with them. You need to listen to their concerns about safety. And I can tell you, a lot of people have trouble, um, if you're a manager, walking out into some of our environments, actually having a discussion with some of the truck drivers or some of the guys driving forklifts. There is one thing you've always got in common, and it's safety. So I start virtually every conversation I have with our people when I walk around our sites with safety. And it's just a great way to engage with your people. I think the other thing uh, with the engagement piece, and I've asked this, I always ask this question um, when we're running safety training sessions, which I'll often go and open. Uh, how many of you would like to work for an unsafe employer? Right? Normally I don't get a hand go up. And so it's, uh, again, for us, it's a way that we can be an employer of choice. People don't want to go and work for an organisation if they think they're going to get hurt. I mentioned the RMS uh, issue before when I was talking about the, the respect side of things, but there's no question in, in our industry being good at safety uh, helps in our relationships with external stakeholders as well. Whether that's customers, and many of our customers push us very hard on safety, or whether that's regulators, uh, it, it's almost a licence to operate. Now, if you're not good at safety, you will have your licence to operate taken away in our industry. Uh, I could, could have probably spent the whole night talking about industrial relations tonight as well, which would have been a different topic, but it, we, have, we have a very highly unionised workforce at Toll, and unions will sometimes take advantage of safety issues with companies to form a wedge between the company and their employees. Uh, we've never had that happen at Toll. And we get the support of unions generally uh, about all the things that we're doing 
on the safety front. So it's, it's also very good from that perspective. I think the main reason though, so there's lots of good reasons, the main reason though is we just don't want to hurt our people. If you've ever had or ever have to have the experience where you've got to ring a family member from one of your employees that has been hurt on your site or killed on your site, you will get passionate about safety. So that is the main driver. We just don't want to hurt our people, nor the communities in which we operate. So uh, I'll talk a little bit about how, maybe just now moving on to a few stories about how we, we use these values and beliefs to help us with what would otherwise be some pretty challenging decisions. Some of them are pretty simple, but I think that hopefully they'll illustrate the point. So the first one is a safety uh, related one, and this is a very recent one that was uh, recounted to me by one of our, our site managers. And a uh, very busy period for this particular part of our business. Uh, they had an enormous amount of freight that they needed to get moved out of their depot that night, and they'd run out of qualified contractors to help them. We put our contractors through a fairly rigorous qualification process. Uh, we test their uh, fatigue management, we test their speed management, all of their training, all those sort of things. So they have to be qualified to work for us. Well, there was a temptation here because they'd run out of contractors and needed to move the freight. They were actually going to engage an unqualified contractor to do the work. And uh, we had one of our supervisory guys on the floor actually came up to everybody and said, look, we've got to stop the conversation. We know safety is the most important thing here, so we're not going to do it. Ring the customer, tell them they're not going to get their freight. So a really simple example where there was pressure on from the customer some of the employees were going to bring in this unqualified contractor, but we had our own people jumped in and said, no, 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 safety is the, the key driver here. Even simple ones, again, I was walking around one of our warehouses about three months ago, and uh, one of the, uh, the guys wor who worked unpacking vehicles was telling me a story where they'd had a, a dispute with a customer because the customer had been packing their pallets too high. And we had our people getting injured trying to reach up and lift heavy cartons off the top of the pallets. I said, well, what did you do about it? And I said, we rang the customer and said, you've, you've got to stop loading your pallets that high because our people are getting hurt. Anyway, the customer said no. So they said to the customer, we're, uh, we're not going to do that for you unless you change. So the customer said, well, okay, we'll go somewhere else. And about a week later, I had a phone call from the CEO of that customer apologising because he heard about the story. He said, why did you move away from toll? And he rang me and basically said, thank you. Um, you've sent a really powerful message through our organisation about how important safety is to you and our guys reacted the wrong way. We want to come back to you. So again, just a simple one where our guys were confident enough to say no to a customer who was asking us to do some unsafe things. <coughs> Sorry, I need to get my papers here going the right way. <laughs> So maybe just a, a couple of examples about some of the other, the other values. Uh, one of the ones you would have seen up there is about openness and transparency. And we, like a lot of other organisations recently, given the economic conditions, have actually had to make some people redundant. It's just been a reflection of the, we don't like doing it, it's been a reflection of the fact that our customers' volumes have been down as far as they have been. Uh, but we've tried to go about that with our people in a very open and transparent way, in a very respectful way. We let them know as soon as we've got an idea um, that uh, there may be issues. We talk through it with them. We certainly don't say, and you're out the door tonight. Um, and we try to help them with new jobs. We try to do all the right things. So that helps not just with the people that are leaving, it helps with the people that are staying as well. They see how we've treated uh, the people that have to go. And the other thing for me, many of you would have read stories in the press about big companies making lots of redundancies. And you would have heard about strike action where people have been, companies have been making people redundant. We've not had one article, nor one industrial dispute, even though I would say we've laid off a lot of people in the last 12 months. So for me it's um, been, you know, you hate doing it, I, I hate doing it. It has an impact on people's lives, but I'm proud of the way that we've, we've actually gone about it when we've had to make the call. Uh, the acting within the law example. So this, is a, this one's a few years old. Uh, we'd had a number of our people in China who 
were looking to grow our business in China. And they'd been working on their strategy for a good 12 months and they'd been working on a particular acquisition for about six months. And they, what they were aiming to do was to actually acquire a Chinese-based um, car carrier. And it sounded like a great idea. China's um, car purchases going up significantly, rapidly growing industry in China. The strategy sounded great. Uh, the financials looked fantastic. Anyway, the, the guys brought it in and they took uh, me and the CFO at the time through the financial analysis. And there was quite a bit of capital expenditure built into the sort of outer lying years of the, of the financial analysis. I said, why, why are we having to spend so much capital? And I said, oh, we're actually having to re um, replace this company's carriers because they're out of spec. They don't comply with the law. I said, ah, well, he's operating today, isn't he? Yep. Well, how's he getting away with that? And you can guess what the answer was. Um, doing the wrong thing and, and doing the wrong thing with officials who would then turn a blind eye. And we just said, I'm sorry, we, we cannot do that. We're not, we're not going to operate that way. And they said, everyone does it. And I said, sorry, we're not. Um, so they didn't like, well, they were frustrated. They understood the decision, but very frustrated with the fact that they developed this great strategy, spent six months working on an acquisition opportunity that in the space of 10 minutes we said no to. Uh, but having these values and beliefs, they understood the decision. So it made what could have otherwise been a difficult decision pretty easy for us. Just talking about the customer's success uh, creates our success. So an example of that. Uh, I, won't, I won't name names. Some of you may know who, who I'm about to talk about. But we lost a very large contract uh, with a very large customer moving their freight from Brisbane into the northern part of Queensland. We'd actually been doing that work for 30 years and our service levels were impeccable. We had a, a, a great relationship with the customer. We did a lot of work for this customer in other parts of the country as well. And uh, they took the work off us on the basis of price, gave it to one of our competitors. And you can imagine how upset we were. And yet they asked us to continue on for six months providing the services to them until they could transition to their new supplier. And there was a fair bit of temptation from a few people to um, ditch them on the spot. And we made a decision that, look, it's really important to our customer that we, this transition is managed as well as it possibly can be. So over the next six months, even the, despite the fact our service levels had been fantastic, that next six months we set records in terms of the service levels for that customer. And um, again, I think everybody who was involved with that extremely proud of the way we've left that customer. I actually had a meeting with their CEO. It's a very large retailer. I had a meeting with their CEO about two weeks ago and he recounted that particular story to me. So he'd become aware of it. And in that meeting told me we just won a very large new contract with them. So it pays off. It absolutely pays off. But again, having that, having that value, having that belief you know, our people didn't question the fact they needed to stay there and do the right thing for that customer. Just conscious of the time, the, the last one I'll finish off with, which if you live in Melbourne, you'll all know about. Uh, so we're actually a sponsor of the Essendon Football Club. So we've had some interesting discussions about whether or not we should continue that sponsorship over the last few years. Uh, I should actually do a bit of a survey. Have you seen our name on the Essendon Footy Club shorts? I need more nods, otherwise I'm going to argue that the sponsorship number should go down. <laughs> <laughs> um, but look, we, it, was, it was very interesting for us because, as I said, we've got all sorts of uh, values there around um, integrity and doing things the right way. And yet here we were faced with a uh, an organisation that we were, were sponsoring that clearly had some issues. So um, a few of us sat down with some of the senior management at the, at the Essendon Footy Club and at this point the management had changed and said, what are you guys going to do about it? And they talked us through, uh, first of all, acknowledging all the mistakes that they'd made and they talked us through all of the things that they were doing to improve the way things were going to be done at that footy club in the future. And as you saw on those beliefs, one of them was people will make mistakes. Um, 
uh, and it's for me, it's not really about making the mistake. It's it's how do you respond to it once you've made it. That, that that's where people get into trouble. And I think Essendon have openly admitted to us and and publicly that they made a mistake with what they did, and the fixes that they put in place. In fact, we had some involvement in some of the changes in the governance structure. Um, you know, we're very, very happy with and we've continued the relationship. But that was a very difficult call. I can tell you we spent a lot of hours debating that, but it was really that acknowledgement that people will make mistakes and it's about how they respond to it, which probably uh, led us in the end to make the decision to continue with that sponsorship, even though I'm a Carlton supporter, which made it even harder. So, uh, look, I think the, the messages that I really want to to leave you with. Uh, first of all, I, I'm a very strong believer that cultures and value in organisations are absolutely critical to success. You can have the best strategies in the world. If you haven't got your culture right, you won't succeed. So I'm a firm believer in that. Uh, there's, there's probably a lot of you in the room that either are already leaders or will become leaders in your organisations at some point down the track. And I think it's really important that you spend time talking about values and culture. You have involvement in establishing the values of whatever organisation that you are working in and then you really get involved and, and live those val values. As leaders you'll all be faced with a lot of really hard decisions and there'll be conflicts amongst your values from time to time. People won't always agree with the decisions that you make but if they see how you've linked those decisions back to your values and your beliefs, they'll understand why you've done it and they'll respect those decisions. So they're probably the, the key messages that I wanted to leave with you all tonight, other than one last thing on the safety front. Um, please challenge your customers and your suppliers on the safety side of things. Make a point of asking them how they're doing on the safety side of things. We're seeing more and more of that now in our organisation, but one of the things I always do when I've got the opportunity is to encourage people like all of you to lift the bar across our community on the safety front. So that's the last thing I'd like to leave with all of you. Make sure you challenge people that you're interacting with on that front.